Welcome, this is Brian Wood, Medical Director for the Mountain West AETC Project ECHO Telehealth Program. Each of our weekly sessions starts with a short talk focused on issues relevant to HIV clinical medicine. The following talk was recorded live here at University of Washington. We will now take you to this week's talk. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak. I'll be talking a little bit about updates from CROI specifically regarding HIV prevention. I have no disclosures. And just a reminder that it is racism, not race, that perpetuates health disparities. As an outline for my talk today, I'll be speaking mostly about new data on CAB-LA, or long-acting cabotegravir as PrEP, with updates from HPTN 083. And then I'll switch to other prevention modality updates, so Islatravir and the Depivirine vaginal ring. So starting off with CAB-LA as PrEP, these are updates from HPTN 083. And just as a reminder, which was true for me too, HPTN 083 is a double-blind RCT of men who have sex with men and transgender women at increased risk of HIV globally. HPTN 083 and 084 in cisgender women has demonstrated that long-acting cabotegravir is superior to daily oral TDF-FTC, or tenofovir amtricitabine, for HIV PrEP, with a 66% reduced risk for HIV acquisition for CAB-LA, versus daily oral PrEP in the pre-specified primary analysis. This has led to FDA approval in addition to the CDC guidelines for cab as PrEP. This abstract presented at CROI provides updates of the blinded study period, which looking at this figure are steps one and two in, at a one-to-one -one randomization to either oral PrEP or cab with an oral lead-in period, and new data on the unblinded study period, which is step three, during which the participants were unblinded and provided open-label TDF-FTC. So in the data for the updated blinded and unblinded year of follow-up, which they refer to as year one unblinded, there are updates to the blinded trial data first, which I've highlighted in that top blue box in this table. So what you can see is that there were two additional infections in each arm, which brings it up to 14 in the cabotegravir arm, with a preserved hazard ratio from prior of 0.34. And then in the year one unblinded, which is that second blue box, there were 11 new infections in the CAB-LA arm and 31 in the TDF-FTC arm, with a very similar hazard ratio, 0.33, but incident rates that were much higher than in the blinded period, so really up to 1.5 times higher. And then in that third blue box right at the bottom, we can see that combined efficacy remained the same with an unchanged hazard ratio. But this does beg the question of why higher rates in the unblinded? And so what Dr. Landovitz pointed out is that there was study product adherence decline in both arms. And so in the TDF-FTC arm, and now these are the red boxes, there was a decrease in detectable plasma tenofovir levels from 86% to 76%. And in the long-acting CAB arm, there was a decrease in CAB injection coverage time from 92% to 80%. And so based on the investigator calculations, this would be expected to explain about 40% of incident cases. And then the remainder 60%, and I thought this was really interesting, this was felt to be increased contribution of person time from high incidence regions, and they really cited Latin America in the year one unblinded period. And those participants were enrolled later, so they contributed more person years to the unblinded portion of the study. The next thing they did was characterize incident infections, and I tried to summarize them in a way that made sense here. So in the primary blinded data, which has already been published in the New England Journal, there were 16 cases of infection in the CAB arm. Four were baseline or prevalent infections. Five occurred more than six months after the last CAB exposure. Three occurred during the oral lead-in period. And four, and I've bolded this, occurred despite on-time cabotegravir injection. In the updated blinded data, where we know there were two new infections in the CAB arm, both occurred despite on-time CAB injection. And then in the year one unblinded period of the 11 infections, one occurred despite on-time cab injection, three occurred because of mostly on-time injection, which they defined as one injection prior to infection with an eight-week or greater delay between injections, and then seven occurred more than six months after the last cabotegravir exposure. Not included were six participants who had infection occur more than three years after enrollment, uh, they were censored from this pre-specified analysis and will be investigated in a tail phase. So here are the author conclusions. The advantage of CAB-LA for HIV PrEP in MSM and transgender women persists with an additional year of follow-up. Increased HIV incidence in both arms may be attributable to attenuation of adherence, 
and increased contribution from high incidence regions. There were no new safety concerns identified. And Cab LA PrEP breakthrough infections remain very rare but unexplained. And so now there are a total of seven cases of breakthrough infection despite on-time injection in 4,660 person years of follow-up. So this is a great segue into the next abstract that was also data from HPTN 083. Cab LA as PrEP, early detection of HIV may reduce INSTE or integrase inhibitor resistance risk. So breakthrough HIV infection is difficult to detect while on Cab LA, and this has been shown in prior published data. Cab suppresses viral replication, delays antibody production, and thus rapid tests and antigen antibody assays often fail to detect infection. Supplemental antibody tests may be negative or indeterminate for months, and HIV RNA levels are often low or undetectable for long periods. The risks of delayed detection of infection are delayed ART initiation, INSTE resistance development, and impact on both personal health and subsequent HIV transmission. So what they did in this study was look at all the incident HIV infections that occurred among all more than 2,000 participants enrolled. And this was from the initial published HPT-1083 data, so there were 16 people. And then for all of those individuals, they ran genotyping. And for the five that had INSTE RAMs, and the two that they were unable to perform genotypic testing on because the HIV-1 RNA level remained five, under 500 copies per mil, those were the people that were included. In all seven of those participants, detection of infection using rapid tests and antigen antibody assays was delayed by a median of 60 days, and all seven ended up receiving CAB injections after infection had occurred. So what they did here was they looked at 21 samples from the seven participants, and did retrospective qualitative RNA testing along with quantitative RNA testing, so they could run this on low viral loads. And then for each case, the first HIV-positive visit that was retrospectively identified by the qualitative RNA assay was then temporally compared to the first site-identified HIV-positive visit, so that was by antigen antibody test. And then a really cool thing they were able to do was take um, INC resistance mutation data, both from the standard genotype assay, but also this new proprietary single genome sequencing assay done at the University of Pittsburgh that could be run on low HIV-1 RNA levels. So I included this figure here, and I apologize, I couldn't find a, a higher resolution for it, just to illustrate how Dr. Eshleman had presented this at CROI for each of the seven cases. And so what we can see here is that a red line, so that vertical line right here, represents the first HIV-positive visit that was retrospectively determined by the qualitative RNA assay or the quantitative. The blue line over on the right represents the first site-detected visit by antigen and antibody assay. Green lines represent cabotegravir injections. Orange dots represent cabotegravir concentration. And then up at the top, you see this table of each kind of test and when they tested positive or negative. And then at the very top, you can see mutations that were listed. So anything that's bolded and underlined is an integrase mutation. And if it's highlighted, that means it was detected on that single genome sequencing assay that could detect genotype low viral load. So rather than going through each of these for each of the seven cases, I just thought I'd summarize the key takeaways. So in five of the seven cases, major INST mutations were first detected retrospectively in the low viral load samples, not just in high viral load breakthrough samples. That single genome sequencing assay was successful for 18 of the 21 samples tested, and detected INSTE RAMs in six of the seven participants, including the two who had no prior genotyping results because of low viral load. Using that qualitative RNA assay with a limit of detection of 30 copies per mil, detected infection before a major INSTE RAM was detected in four of the cases, or before an additional RAM accumulated in two of the cases. And INSTE mutations developed after the first positive visit in six of the seven cases, and in the one case with a major mutation at the first positive visit, more accumulated afterwards. So here are the author conclusions. HIV screening with a sensitive RNA assay in those on Cab LA PrEP can identify earlier infection. This may allow for earlier ART initiation and reduced risk of NC resistance. This should be performed using the most sensitive RNA assay available. These findings support the U.S. package insert and recent CDC guidance for HIV testing in the setting of Cab LA PrEP which I think many people will recall now, say, to do HIV-1 RNA testing. And data is not yet available on the use of what to do in terms of treatment in that setting and whether NCD-based ART could be used. 
I do want to highlight, and I think this will be, in my mind, the biggest topic of discussion, that even the author said that in the context of proven high efficacy, long-acting cabotegravir should be considered for HIV prep in settings where HIV screening is not readily available. But before that, I'll pivot quickly to other prevention modalities. I wanted to give an update on islatravir. This is a novel class agent, a nucleoside reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitor, or NRTTI, under development for treatment and prevention. There were two formulations under study for PrEP, a once-monthly oral formulation and a once-yearly subdermal implant. And previous data had demonstrated safety and tolerability at various doses. Unfortunately, that's now on hold based on changes in lymphocytes and CD4 counts, both of which have dropped in clinical trials. And so the PrEP program and the treatment program have been placed on clinical hold by the US FDA. Nonetheless, I thought it would be worth it to describe the week 24 outcomes of this phase 2A trial of Islatravir. This is the oral monthly formulation, and they were looking at the 60 milligram dose versus 120 milligram versus placebo. The first thing they looked at was metabolic and renal outcomes, um, which I think is pertinent given concerns around TDF-FTC use. And so there were no discontinuations for any metabolic or renal reasons. There were very small, non-significant changes from baseline and weight, and a little higher in the higher dose group, but still not significant, and no changes in renal function or bone mineral density. In a second abstract, investigators looked at islatravir concentrations in cervical, vaginal, and rectal tissue, as well as PBMC and plasma with the monthly oral dosing. And what they found is at both doses, there were comparable levels of drug concentration across tissue types in women and men, and a high correlation between the plasma islatravir concentration and concentrations of the active phosphorylated form, ISLTP, in all of these tissues. And so the conclusion is we could use systemic islatravir as a surrogate for tissue exposure. But we'll see what comes next with the decision-making between Merck and the FDA. Finally, I wanted to end with an update to the REACH trial, which looked at choice and adherence to the depivirine vaginal ring or oral prep by young African women. And I'll start again with a caveat that there has been removal of approval consideration of the, of the ring to the FDA. This was a voluntary removal, as initial feedback was that the FDA was unlikely to support U.S. approval, given the context of current HIV prevention landscape for women in the U.S. Nonetheless, the WHO recommends the depivirine ring as a PrEP option for women. And this is based on prior data that it reduces the risk of HIV-1 infection around 30%, and is well tolerated with no difference in resistance rates for NNRTIs. That risk reduction of 30% was based on two phase three studies, but open label extension data since has demonstrated that with increased ring use, that efficacy can go up to over 50%. The REACH trial is a pretty novel, in my mind, randomized crossover trial, where uh, investigators looked at monthly oral TDF-FTC versus the vaginal ring in three periods. So in the first, participants were randomized to one or the other. In the second, they were crossed over to the option they weren't on previously. And in the third six-month period, they could pick either. So they could pick the ring, oral prep, or neither. Previous data from the first two periods has already been presented and demonstrated higher ring acceptability and compliance over oral prep. And in this choice period, 67% chose the ring, 31% chose oral prep, and 2% neither. Residual depivirine levels in the used rings showed some to high use of the ring and moderate to high adherence of oral prep. And high adherence to oral prep in the crossover period was strongly associated with the choice of oral prep. There was no such association for the rings. And so the author conclusion was that adolescent girls and young women can make informed choices about HIV prevention products and are motivated to continue to use a product of their preference after previous oral prep or rate use. So with that, I'll just end with what I think are the main takeaways from these abstracts. Cab LA for HIV prep in men who have sex with men and transgender women remains superior to daily oral prep. Breakthrough HIV infection on Cab LA remains rare but unexplained but the most dreaded outcome of INSTI resistance may be mitigated by sensitive RNA assay screening. In terms of other formulations, Islatravir has a less certain future due to its clinical hold, and the depivirine vaginal ring has a promising future in certain populations, although it will not be an option in the United States for now. Finally, I think this is an old adage in PrEP and HIV in general, but I think this really highlighted for me how critical choice is in PrEP adherence and efficacy, and that even as we come up with new options, that it won't, there's no one that maybe is the solution for everybody. I think that was really a key takeaway for me.
that is all I have, and I'm really excited to hear other people's input and questions. Thank you for watching this edition of the Mountain West AETC Project Echo Didactic Series. If you like this talk, please click the red subscribe button and please check out other talks in our series. Until next time, this is Brian Wood, Medical Director, signing off.